Exposition by Charles Hedden Spurgeon 1 Kings 10, 1-13, Matthew 12, 38-45 Let us first read part of the tenth chapter of the first book of Kings and, afterwards, a part of the twelfth chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew. 1 Kings 10, 1 And when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions. Her visit, you see, had a religious aspect. She heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord. He had wisdom of various kinds, but it was his knowledge of God, and of God's ways that seem chiefly to attract this ruler from a far distant land. 2. And she came to Jerusalem with a very great train, with camels that bore spices, and very much gold, and precious stones, and when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him about all that was in her heart. She came with a price in her hand to get wisdom. Well did Solomon say, buy the truth, and sell it not. No price is too dear to pay for it, but any price would be too cheap to sell it. 3. So Solomon answered all her questions, there was nothing too difficult for the king, that he could not explain it to her. His wisdom came from God and, therefore, it was full and complete, and could not be confounded by man. Let us seek after the wisdom which comes from above, and remember that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Indeed, is it not the sum total of wisdom, really, to fear, in a filial sense, the Lord Most High? 4. 5. And when the Queen of Sheba had seen all Solomon's wisdom, and the house that he had built, and the food of his table, and the sitting of his servants, and the attendance of his ministers, and their apparel, and his cupbearers, and his ascent by which he went up unto the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her she was a queen, but she had never seen such royal magnificence as Solomon's. The ascent by which he went up unto the house of the Lord appears to have been a marvellous viaduct constructed of the most ponderous stones, by which the king went from his own house up to the temple itself. I have read that an arch of that viaduct is standing at the present day and it is still a marvel. To this princess, it must have seemed a wonder of wonders. 6-12 And she said to the king, It was a true report that I heard in my own land of your acts and of your wisdom. However, I believed not the words until I came, and my eyes have seen it, and, behold, the half was not told me, your wisdom and prosperity exceeds the fame which I heard. Happy are your men, happy are these, your servants, which stand continually before you, and that hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God, which delighted in you to set you on the throne of Israel, because the Lord loved Israel forever, therefore made he you king, to do judgment and justice. And she gave the king an hundred and twenty talents of gold, and of spices very great store, and precious stones, there came no more such abundance of spices as these which the queen of Sheba gave to king Solomon. And the navy also of Hiram that brought gold from Ophir, brought in from Ophir great plenty of armug trees, and precious stones. And the king made of the armug trees pillars for the house of the Lord, and for the king's house, also harps and psalteries for singers, there came no such armug trees, nor were seen unto this day. Probably these armug trees were trees of sandalwood. Whatever they were, they seem to have been the best timber known to the Easterns and, therefore, Solomon very properly used them in the house of the Lord.
Let the harps of our praises be made of such wood that there shall be no others equal to them in the whole world. Let us give to our Lord our best young blood, our warmest zeal, our highest thoughts, our most careful attention. Let us give him, in fact, the whole of our being, the love of our heart. He should be served with the best of the best, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. 13. And King Solomon gave unto the Queen of Sheba all her desire, whatever she asked, beside that which Solomon gave her of his royal bounty. So she turned and went to her own country, she and her servants. The king first of all bountifully gave her a present which he thought most fitting. And then, afterwards, permitted her to ask whatever she would. How much is this like our King Solomon, who has already given us all our hearts can wish for and yet, if there is any right desire that is still ungratified, he provides the golden mercy seat at the foot of his throne where we may present our petitions to him, encouraged by his gracious word, ask what you will, according to your faith, so shall it be unto you. Matthew 12, 38 39. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from you. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. The queen of Sheba did not ask for a sign. She did not expect Solomon to work a miracle, but, sitting down in his presence, she proposed her hard questions and meekly awaited his answers. So should these scribes and Pharisees have done with the Lord Jesus Christ. These were his signs. 40, 41. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and, indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. Jonah was a servant, Jesus was the master. Jonah preached only one sermon, Jesus preached many. That sermon was a short one, Jesus Christ labored long after souls. Jonah was a man full of infirmities and with an unloving heart, Jesus was tender and compassionate. Jonah did but hurry through the streets, crying, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown, without a word of mercy, Jesus lived long among the people, giving them directions warnings and invitations to seek and find salvation. Behold, a greater than Jonah is here. 42. The Queen of the South will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. As I have so recently, preached upon this verse, I need not say anything about it just now. 43. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man. Mark, not when he is turned out of him by superior force, but when he has gone out of his own accord. 43. He walks through dry places, seeking rest, and finds none. The devil was in the Jews of old, but he went out of them at the time of the Babylonian captivity, that heavy punishment cured them of idolatry. But the devil could never find a resting place in Gentile hearts so pleasant to himself as among God's own people. 44. Then he says, I will return to my house from where I came out, and when he is come, he finds it empty, swept, and garnished. I will go back to those Jews, says the devil and, when he comes back, he finds them without any true love to God, 
empty, swept, and garnished. See how correctly the Pharisee is dressed and note with what sanctimonious unction he repeats his hypocritical prayers. He fasts twice in the week and pays tithes of his mint and anise and come in. The devil finds the house empty, swept, garnished and, as he does not care whether he lives in a foul heart or a clean one, so long as he can but live in it, he takes up his abode there again. 45. Then he goes and takes with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. If idolatry did not come back to the Jews, the devil of pride and self-conceit and many more came and fought against the Son of God, so that they became worse than they were before. And the first devil of the Jewish people was nothing compared with the seven devils which afterwards possessed them. We have seen some men of this kind. Under temporary conviction, they had given up certain outward sins, but, afterwards, they have been ten times worse than they were before. We have known a man to be a drunk and we have rejoiced to see him leave his cup spot, yet, when he has made a self-righteousness out of his temperance and set himself up against God and his truth, we have verily believed that he has had within him seven devils worse than the first. A man may reform himself to blacker stains and wash himself with the waters of his self-righteousness till he becomes more hard to clean than he would have been at the first. Oh! for the mighty hand of one who is stronger than the prince of hell to throw the devil out. And then he will never come back again, but if he goes out by mere human persuasion, or by our own wills and wishes, he will most certainly come back to us. If the Holy Spirit turns him out, he will never gain an entrance any more. 45. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation, 